All right, so uh, we've been talking about the final episode, uh, and let's talk to someone who most certainly was there, uh, Stephen Van Zandt, Silvio Dante. There he is. There he is. How you doing, buddy? Hey. Hi, gang. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Unlike Steve and myself, Silvio survives the finale of The Sopranos. Correct. He's alive at the end of the finale, which is a big deal. He is alive and waiting for the sequel. Yes. <laughs> He's waiting. <laughs> waiting. But, you know, they, 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 David fooled us and did a prequel and screwed the whole thing up. He, he screwed hanging, everything up. He's hanging on by. Uh, was that something important to you about staying alive at the end of the show? Was it ever discussed or what? Um, uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. You know, uh, he gave me a few options. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't get any options. It was it was death by Tony, and that was it. There was no, there was no way out for Christopher. He was do a doomed soul to begin Steve, with. When, when did you find out that you were going to get shot? Did you know? Uh, you no, know, probably, probably. You know, when uh, the last script came out. You know, I don't, I don't think it was. Uh, you know, it was only when you were going to die, I think, that he gave you more more notice, you know, ahead of time, you know. But for that, for that, uh, it was like a, a typical, whenever the scripts came out, you know, I, I read it. And, uh, you know, it was uh, quite an experience, you know, <laughs> those <laughs> rubber bullets flying around in that car, man. I was like, you know, <laughs> how, how, does, how does Stallone and uh, Schwarzenegger do, do this with a, you know, a, a thousand, a thousand scenes with, with, with gunplay, you know, I, I almost got, I almost got killed for real in that scene, you know. The, really? The bullet, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. The, the bullets didn't go through the, didn't go through the windshield like it was supposed to and bouncing around in the car, you know, uh, like, you know, whoa. <laughs> what do you mean bullets? What bullets did they use? They're like they're like blanks, I guess. You know, yeah, blanks. But they had something came out of the gun to to break yeah. the windshield. Oh. Yeah. Instead of instead of it being squibbed up. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. God. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're shooting somebody, that then it's that it's squibbed. But but right. no, if you're blowing a hole in the windshield, you know, you got to blow the hole in the windshield. You know, <laughs> and it was like ding, 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 ding. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, I got but a I whole think, new respect, you know. I, I, I think, uh, but like it, about staying alive, at that time, they're very, if Jim would have uh, not passed away, I think it's very possible there could have been a, a, a sequel, you know. Maybe, uh, maybe, yeah. You know, yeah. we talked about it. He, he. After a couple of years, he said, "If they pay me enough money, I, he would be Tony Soprano again." You know? Yeah, why not? You know? I mean, it was it was so great, and uh, you know, people never stopped. They never stopped loving it. And look at what just happened with the quarantine. We discovered all over again. You know? Uh, you know? I, I I heard more about Sopranos and, and Lily Hammer this past year than the you know the previous. Ten years. You know? Yeah, me too. Hundred yeah. percent. What? What? It, when you finally watched the finale? When uh, was it? When we all watched it in Florida? Was that the first time you saw it? Yeah. What was yeah. going through? What were some of the takeaways for you? Like when you first watched that? How did you feel? Well, you know, like everybody else, at first you think, did something go wrong? <laughs> you know, did somebody pull out the plug here or or what? You know, because we were seeing it on a on a big screen in a tent down at the Hard Rock, you know, it was kind of an you know improvised situation. So it was very possible that something went wrong, you know, technologically there. Uh, and but then you know, okay, that really is the ending. And you think to yourself, um, you know, you see, it was a surprise. You know, I think for everybody, uh, I don't think anybody could have predicted that. So you, you start thinking to yourself, OK, what 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 did you expect to happen? You know, or what would you have what would you have liked to happen? You know, and 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 I had to deal with it the very next morning. I went on a radio station that was a nationally syndicated morning show, one of my affiliates of my radio show. And they had one, it's one of those, you know, national morning shows 
So I had, I, I had to hear from the entire country how much you know, they, <laughs> they, they, they hated the ending. And I'm, you know, and I'm picking this barrage of, of, you know. And finally, I started fighting back. I'm like, okay, let me hear your ending. Okay, you know. Did you want Tony to die? Well, no. Did you want Edie to die? Well, no. The kids? No. You know, so, and, you know, by the end of the radio show, you know, I kind of had won people over to the point where, like, they realized, you know, uh, they, maybe, maybe it was a rather clever ending after all because they didn't really want anybody to die. And, uh, and you know, in the end, you know, it became like one of those things where they, people just had to accept the fact that, you know, the camera zoomed in and the camera zoomed out, you know, uh, that that's, you know, we were we were we were we were visiting these people's lives for uh, 10 years, you know, seven seasons in 10 years, whatever it was. And now uh, they're going to carry on whatever, whatever. And you can, you know, you can make up the rest of their lives, you know, in, in any way you want to make it up, you know. Uh, you know, when we we went down there, we've talked about it on the show before, uh, you know, it was nine of us. We were at the Foxwoods the night before, if you remember, right? Uh, and then we took the private plane down to the Hard Rock. Uh, okay. And then uh, 10,000 people showed up. You talk about it in the book. I mean, even you were impressed by that crowd. I remember you telling me, uh, like, you were impressed because here comes 10,000 people. There's a red carpet throughout the casino. We're going down it, and it's insanity yeah no, no, i don't think anyone had ever seen anything like that uh probably before or even since you know uh it was an unusual uh it was it was a you know a rock and roll experience you know for for a tv show which was just uh i think unprecedented i re really you know and uh and I, and I remember saying you know to, to, to jimmy and Edie or lorraine you know you know, you want to know what it's like to be a rock star. This is it. Here it is. Here it is. You know, uh, and 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 the, the Sopranos cast were total rock stars uh, at, at that point. You know, and and uh, I was I was just uh, I was happy with the whole the way the, the way the, the way that it evolved. You know, because uh, you know at first you know it, it was a different experience for me to to feel uh, the the way actors. You know, interact with each other. You know, uh, is a little, little different than, than than musicians. You know, and uh, and Mikey, I don't know if you noticed this. You know, being both yourself, but uh, you know, yes, there's competition in 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 the music business, but it's really more of a family than than than, than you know than an adversarial relationship. Um, with actors, you know, it's a little different. It's a little different. It was, you know, everybody was a little bit more defensive at first. You know, uh, you know, you know. I'm I'm walking in, you know, completely naive. You know, and uh, you know, I'm everybody's friend. You know, that's one of my things. You know, and I could sense, I could sense, you know, people being a little defensive, a little bit, you know, uh, wary about uh, opening up. You know, and so I was, I was happy that um, by the end of the Sopranos, we really had turned into a rock band. You know, um, you know, and I think that was unusual, uh, you know, for for uh, well, it may, maybe it's a typical thing for 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 uh, series, you know, TV no, series that not. last a long time. Uh, oh, even that, I don't think no, it. Right? I, I think it's uh, atypical. I think some uh, of it had to do with the fact that a lot of us knew each other from the past. You know, like I knew. Johnny V from acting school. I, you know, I knew Vinny before. I knew Tony before. We oh. worked together, a lot of us. The other thing is, you know, I, I think it's just, just the, the kind of chemistry of the different personalities, having that success together that a lot of us had been working toward. You know, a lot of us were in similar positions career-wise, you know, before The Sopranos, being a lot of indie movies, a couple of Hollywood movies, a lot of theater, that kind of thing. Make a little money, maybe people know you, maybe they don't, except for Lorraine, really, who was nominated for an Oscar. But a lot a lot of everybody else was kind of in the same boat. So to have this success on something you loved, like I always say, at that time, for me, The Sopranos was exactly what I wanted to do on every yeah. level. Like, I couldn't have picked or, you know, you know, programmed something better for me at that time. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And who I was with, the camaraderie, the fun, the work, the you know, the, the passion for the work and, and the reception of it. And I think we all kind of felt that in some way. Yeah, and and I think that comes from from when it when it comes from one man's vision, like it did. I think that's what happens. Rather than uh, a million notes from the network and uh, you know <laughs> casting because they were because uh, they're famous or already or something like that. You know, David Chase was no compromise, none, zero. You know, uh, right. uh, he handpicked everybody like he would in a, in a, in a band, you know, and, right. and, and uh, I think that's that probably made the difference. You know, and there have been, a, you know, a couple other TV shows, I'm sure, like like that, you know, where, where it was one person's vision. But uh, but probably, you know, never quite as uncompromising as this one, because, uh, you know, everybody knows uh, every everybody turned the show down because he was insisting on filming in Jersey, that alone. You know, uh, right. but he said everybody turned it down. They, they were laughing at him. You know, nobody films in New Jersey. <laughs> what are you crazy? Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and he was not going to compromise. And, and if nobody picked up the show because of that, he was like, he was fine with that. Yeah. I, I don't care. I'm going down with the ship here. You know, uh, at that point in his life, he was, you know, he had done TV his whole life. And he's like, no more, no more. No more compromise, you know, All no right. more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this the way I see it, you know, because it was personal for him, you know, especially that first season. You know, I think everybody knows you. I'm sure you guys have talked about it a million times. But, uh, uh, you know, that first season was basically the movie he had in mind divided up into 13 segments, you know, sure. and, and, and that was all he had in mind. When he came to me one day, he says, I hope there's not a second season because I have no idea what, <laughs> what it would be. <laughs> you know? yeah. I kinda, I said everything I wanted to say in this first season. You know, I, you know, it's all about, you know, the mother, the mother trying to kill the son. You know? Oh, my God. You know? You know, but we had spent a lot of time together. Most, you know, most shows, Stevie, you know, you go in, you do your thing. Everyone's cordial on the set. You go in, it's like a fucking job. You punch the clock, you punch, go in, know your shit, you go out. But there were so many parties, so many premieres, charities. I mean, we spent a lot of time with each other yeah. uh, on camera, off camera. And David kind of consciously or subconsciously picked each one of us, like you said, kind of from the same background. Most of yeah. us are kind of from the same place, you know. Uh, I, I yeah, I think I think it was conscious, you know, I mean, like, you know, he, he, I mean, he had been in a rock band as a kid, you know, what I mean, so he he right. kind of probably thought that way, you know, I mean, a little a little bit, you know, as opposed to the, you know, this, this sort of competitive Hollywood community, which, you know, everybody's ready to cut each other's throats for an extra line, you know, or, you know. <laughs> Push, pushing somebody out of the scene so they can get right. the camera yeah. angle, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, he had a different, it was a different kind of uh, vibe from him right from the beginning, I think. And, uh, you know, and we all, and we all fit, fit right in because, uh, you know, I, and I, and it also it's came down from Jimmy, I think, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy being a character, you know, I, I think was a big factor, you know, and I talk about it in the book, you know, cause he, he was not coming from that lead guy way of thinking, you know. He was a character actor, and he and he uh, and he had that he had that that kind of uh, you know esprit de corps, you know that kind of working class. We're kind of in this together thing, you know, yeah. uh, which he proved uh, you know over and over again. You know, sharing when he got some big money, he would share it with the cast. Who the hell does that? Nobody. You know, nobody. Nobody. You know. Unheard of. You know, he would he would buy us gifts. You know, I mean, I was like Jesus. You know, uh, which was you know, I, I didn't realize how different that was. You know, what I mean, I, I mean, I thought I knew it was fantastic and, and and great, but I didn't know how unique it was till later. And, but uh, but he had that. He 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 had the he changed the whole vibe on the set because uh, he, he just he just was one of those. He was he's he's a working class journeyman actor. And I think most of the people in the show were, you know, and so everybody was was kind of in the same place, you know. When I when I was walking, you know, when I was walking in, and I saw him sitting there when I when I was still Tony Soprano, and I saw him sitting there, I said to Sheila Jeff, I said, 
I know that guy. That guy's that guy's terrific. You know, I just saw him in True Romance. I think I seen him in Get Shorty, and I might maybe even the submarine one. You know, with Denzel Washington. You know, and I and I and I had noticed him. I had noticed him in those movies. You know, just for True Romance, which was a movie no one had seen at the time for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, you know, I said, I said that guy, that guy is terrific. You know, he 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 would make a really good Tony. You know, and she and she didn't know who he was. You know, uh, she said, who, who's, "Who's he?" You know, I said, "I just saw him in these movies. He's terrific." She said, "I never heard of him. I you know, I didn't. I don't know." You know, so shut up. You got the part. Shut the fuck up and go in there and audition for HBO. You know, <laughs> were you nervous when you went into audition? You know, I, 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 well, I, well, not, not until I walked into the room, you know, and, and then they got the bleachers. It was like the Roman Coliseum. You know, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, at that point, I was like, holy shit. You know, it's a little, 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 little scary then, you know, yeah. but uh, but I, I had, you know, I, I had really gone over that scene quite a bit. You know, I, I'd done it with. My friend Jay Cox and Verna Bloom. I had done it with my wife. You know, uh, you know, I had really you know gone over and over that that one that that one scene and uh, you know, and they you know they you know they, they, it was a uh, it, it was a little intimidating. It was you know, it was. Oh fuck! Yeah. Uh, what 100%. do you think happened? Yeah, is Tony Soprano alive or dead in your opinion? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you know what I I think I'll it was put you right on the spot. Time. I think he's alive. I think he's alive. <laughs> what do you think? Honestly, this, well, uh, there's no uh, wrong or right answer. Do you remember that Vanity Fair article? Do you remember remember doing that? I do. I think it was Vanity, right? A yeah. couple of years after the show, and and uh, they talked to all the actors, and uh, and I I'm sticking with what I said then, which you know, when the when a guy asked me, "Come on, tell me the story. Tell me what really happened." I said, you want to know what really happened? He says, yes, I want to know what really happened. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you, all right? This is the last time I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it one time. This is it. Don't ask again. Are you ready? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, the director yelled cut, and the actors went home. <laughs> all right. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> well, you are a politician, Stephen. You are a politician. <laughs> On that note, thank you for joining us at the, on this so historic much, occasion. Bro. Thank you. Always, you guys. always good to see you. Always great see to see you talk. soon. Thanks, buddy. All right. Take care. All right. There you go. The director <laughs> yell cut. There we go. That's, that's kind of what I believe. Politician. Nah, <laughs> no, no. I, I think that's a good answer. That was great. Thank you, uh, Stevie, for coming back on, giving his final uh, say on this. I'm great glad we got show. him here on the last episode. It means a lot, man. It would Absolutely. not be complete without him. Uh, never says no. Good guy, Stevie Van Zandt, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. You said, Let's take a little break, get into the episode. Always great talking to Stevie Van Zandt, I'll tell you that. Yeah, his book is great. Fans should get it. It's very entertaining and very informative, as is. is Stephen himself. And his book is great, and our book is great. And our, our book, book is, is doing fantastic, well. yeah. And if you haven't gotten it yet, it makes a great Christmas gift. Woke up this morning. Uh, how's everything, man? You been all right? Yeah, I'm okay. We're down to the wire. Two left. Yeah. Two you feeling sad? You sad? You happy? It's weird. You know, it's bittersweet. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's strange. We came a long ways. That's for sure. You know what's strange? We're finally, I think, getting the knack of this. And now it's in. It took us like 80 episodes or so. It took about, yeah, to loosen up. <laughs> <laughs> to figure out what the hell we're doing. <laughs> but if you want lessons, not now, now does this qualify? You know, these people do workshops. Now a podcast. We have a Webby Award winning Michael and Steve will tell you. How to put up a podcast. Of course. We know now. <laughs> we know as much as anybody else, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you were telling me, listen, when we first met Andy, we neither one of us knew him before this podcast. You know, Not at all. We didn't no, know him from Adam. Didn't know from Adam. We met him, uh, and he was the sweetest guy. And now you said he's become a well, little you bit. you said it, too. 
Yeah, but he's become a little bit of a, a tyrant and a drunk. He's a you tyrant. Know? He's kind of a diva. You know, listen, we all know, all of us, when, when the Sopranos took off and people got famous, everybody went off the rails. You like to deny that, but you did. No, too. You I, were I did of, not. You were out of your, your skull, <laughs> believe me. Uh, you know, um, so... It, that's what happens, you know, success, notoriety, being in the public eye, the spotlight, it messes you up. And he's got a lot of fans, Sandy. He's got a lot of fans. He's constantly, people are constantly asking for him to come. Uh, the Vernorettes. When are we going to see him? When are we going to see him? Let, let's, mm. come, Michael, let's sneak up on him. Let's oh, no, him. I don't know. You really want to do that? Fucking come on. Come on. Put Andy on. Put Andy on. But I don't Is know. Yeah. Look at oh, him. Yeah, it's called Talking, Talking Sopranos. To blow the lid off the podcast industry. Look at this fucking guy. He's making he's deals making behind deals. our back. You see that? You yeah. fucking Andy. <laughs> Look, he's got a bottle of Grey Goose behind him. That was my idea. That was my idea, Talking, Talking <laughs> Sopranos. We're going to rewatch the podcast episode by episode. Look at this guy. Episode. What are you it's, boozing? It's fucking early. What I'm, are you boozing? Hey, it's afternoon. <laughs> you see? He doesn't care anymore. He's all, he's gone off the Christ. deep end. It happened a long time ago. Look I told it. you that, Steve. Andy. You know, I got a call from I got a call from uh one of his sons. They were very concerned. Yeah. They said, I'm What are you doing to my father? What happened to my dad? He was a suburban dad. Now look at him. He's a I've, fucking afternoon boozing fool. <laughs> Enjoying life. That's it. That's what it's you, about. You're going to enjoy life now that this show is wrapping up. I mean, how do you feel about that, Andy? Well, I got um, a lot of things in the works, you know, coming next. A lot of big projects. We, I don't. Do they need a host? Nor do I. Look at him. It's you're possible. Fucking, you're doing a little backstabbing. You went fucking Hollywood, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, He's you know, Hollywood. you got to do whatever works. Now, now Andy, the, the, the fans love you out there. Absolutely. They love you. I love fan, you. Hey, so what has been the hardest job, uh, the, the hardest part of this job? What has been the hardest, you know, when you started, you were a nice fella. What happened? Where did it all go bad, Andy? Well, I'd like to say that it was the technology and the, you know, difficult scheduling and, and all of that. But really, the most difficult part was pretty much dealing with talent. That's really the hardest. But And by talent, you mean Steve Sharippa, right? <laughs> No, no, he means I'm no not talent. that talented. <laughs> no talent. Because I ain't talented. So that's really? for sure. So dealing with me and Michael was the hardest part of the job, really? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. But and that doesn't what, surprise me. And and, and what uh, what made you turn to drinking again? You were sober for what? I was years? good. I was I was a teetotaler till about episode sixty. And then episode uh, sixty. Yeah, that's when it. I think it turned somewhere there. So season five. And around then, season uh, five. You know, listen, I don't drink that much. Maybe a bottle a day or something. That's all. But, a bottle uh, of Grey Goose. <laughs> and you're smoking weed, don't you? Smoke big bombs. You know, not all the time, but you now, know. now this is a family I mean, affair. Uh, we have Ty, your son. You have three sons: Ty, yes. Tyler, and what's the other one? Dylan. Dylan, it's what Tro happened? Tyler, Troy, and Dylan. Tyler, Troy, and Dylan, and they help out. So it's kind of like a family affair here. Yep, that's it. They're yep, they're on. They help out. They help record. They help manage talent sometimes. And do you pay them, or is it child labor? You just it's child make labor. them work for free. Pay no, they I, child labor. kids. What do they got? He's got to pay them. Right. You don't pay your kids for doing a job. Why? Well, no. They're in debt to him. He's exactly. raised them. He's they're put them through off, school. They're paying Come off on. their debts. Really? And now uh, I hear you're going to Vegas. Now, are you going to be looking for the ladies of the evening, Andy? You want to meet no, us up with one? No, I ladies of the afternoon. He's an afternoon drunk. Come on, Steve. You know that. He, by the evening, he's evening, out. I'm asleep. I'm he's asleep. Cold. By he's out cold. <laughs> um, Grandma, you know, Grandma Gums is still out there. Grandma Gums. <laughs> but yeah, it's Grandma Gums. Aren't hookers cheaper in the afternoon, Steve? Oh, in sure. Vegas? Yeah. Sure, of course. Yeah, you get them. There you uh, go, Andy. It's yeah. like a cab. You know, the cab Cut rate is at, at night. The cab, the meter's running. It's higher. Surcharge. Cab at night. Yeah, yeah. Afternoon, you could get them between gigs. 
You sure? I'm happy to send Grandma Gums up there. <laughs> I'll have to check with the kids, but uh, we'll see. The, oh, you're taking the kids with you? Yeah. <laughs> well, he's going to be 21, Grandma Gums. They're all that's 21. A, They're all over. <laughs> they, that's a specialty. Young boys. <laughs> Andy, you, uh, has this experience really ruined you for podcasts forever? Are you are you you know going to try to jump right back into the fray? Um, I don't know whether it's ruined me, but I'm definitely damaged. But uh, I yeah. think it'll take some time. You know, maybe Vegas will. I'll be able to rehab, and you know, after yeah, that's a great place to time. rehab. <laughs> Vegas, you know, it's like after Tony Soprano. You'll be eating peyote. <laughs> But You'll eat peyote, be yelling in the desert by uh, by Thursday. I get it. I get it. Uh, Andy, I suggest B E T T E R H E L P, <laughs> BetterHelp dot com. I already have an account. I've been I've been working with BetterHelp for months now. You have it. Yes, absolutely. Well, listen. Uh, it was great talking to you. The fans love you, Andy. Thanks. Whatever you do when you're in Vegas, do not mention Steve's name because he is persona non grata in Vegas. He he's there's pictures of him in casinos. Don't you know keep him out. Do I'm not in the black book. You know him. You he's know, in the black book. He's untouchable. I've heard do, that. Do not. Heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go Stay don't away. go dropping his name. Well Andy, if you get in trouble out there, let me know. Uh I have Grandma Gums on speed dial. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to. Uh, you got the same phone as Grandma Gums. She's got a. She's got that same that same model. Grandma Gums. <laughs> you know this is making a big comeback. Yeah, huge. I see I'm it all over the place. You. All the kids. It's kind of hip now. It's hip to have a, spl- a flip phone. I'm yeah. a pioneer. A pioneer. Andy, who was your favorite guest uh, that we've had? And we've had a lot of guests on the show. Who was your favorite guest? That's tough. Um, I really like Michael Raspoli. I thought he was fun. He's a nice, really nice guy. I thought he was great. And um, Matt Weiner was a good was a good guest. I thought he was fantastic. Um, Robert Patrick. Uh, they were some right. of my favorites because they, you know, I didn't know those guys at all. Never seen them, and they just, you know, they they just really were great interviews. So surprising and all nice people. And you know what's funny? Michael Raspoli was our first guest. Up until that point, Michael, we had done him, uh, did the shows ourselves. Yeah, yeah it wasn't, that guy. was a mistake. <laughs> He's yeah. the nicest guy. Well, we guy. had to kick it off. What the fuck? We, we made a lot. Off and it yeah, was... We made a lot of mistakes. I, have you gone back and watched any of these? Me? Me? Yeah. No, I'm oh, straight. <laughs> Listen to me. And I mean this on my hand to God on a stack of Bibles. I have not watched or listened to five minutes of this podcast. Will you ever? Never. Never. Well, I don't even know <laughs> what I'm talking about week to week. Five minutes. I haven't either. We'd probably be horrified. I would not. I don't want to listen to this. I kind of want to forget about it. It's kind of like things. That's Vinny's p- podcast. Yeah, yeah. No, but I kind of just want to forget that it existed. When it's over in a few weeks, that's it. I never did it. It's one of those things you just want to erase from your mind. It's like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Once you did it, that's that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, not five minutes. Poor Andy had to edit and and, and do I'm what he does. Well, that's second. why he's drinking all the time. Yeah. I would too. How do you think over. he gets? How do you think he gets through it? Yeah, over and over. I think you know what might have took him over the edge. The, the, Milton Burrow's cock. That might have took him over. Yeah, I was a little have, traumatized by that. I was you were traumatized? Yeah. Well, Andy, anything you want to say to the fans out there? So seriously, uh, I just want to thank Michael and Steve. I just want to thank both of you guys for being such fantastic hosts. I kid, but you guys are really great. It's been an honor and a privilege to work with you. Um, you've really been great partners, and, and I've, I've loved doing this podcast. All the guests have been really gracious, and and it's been amazing to meet all these people and see how you know nice people they really are. So that's been fun. A big thank you to Jeff Sussman, by the way. I'm not sure the podcast would really have come together without him. He's been no, great. So it would not. Um, I want to give a big thank you to him. Uh, my kids, 
Ty and Troy mostly have been working on it and um, they did a great job. And it's just been amazing to work on what I think is the greatest show ever on television to do a deep dive into it. And, and it's been an honor and a privilege. So uh, thank you, thank you guys. And, and um, I just want to add that it's been great. And cheers with uh, which is actually iced tea. Thank you. Yes. Very well, much. Andy, you know, we feel we feel the same way. You know, listen, the Sopranos argue uh, arguably the greatest show on TV. We set out to make the greatest podcast ever. We didn't do that, but we did have a good time, <laughs> I think. Absolutely. Well, we I think we made the greatest Soprano podcast ever. We did that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well. Okay. Okay. You don't think so? You think there's yeah. better soprano no, podcasts out there? But I, but I, I don't. But I don't know how much that <laughs> means, really. We did the best we could. We did the best we could. There you go, <laughs> Andy. All right. Thanks, Andy. All right. Uh, see you guys. Just please. See you. Pace yourself. You know, you, you know what's weird? Uh, have we ever met Andy in person? Yeah, in the studio. That's the only time. Uh, we went out to dinner once. Oh, that's we, right. We went to Forlini's. Yeah, and he didn't pick up the check. <laughs> Andy didn't pick up the fucking check. I didn't see him reach in, did you? He picked up I the reached. glass. He picked up the bottle. <laughs> what did he pick up? He see reached for his glass of vodka. See <laughs> you right. later. Okay. All right, Andy. The great Andy Verderam, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it. You heard it and saw it here. <laughs> Only... Oh. On yeah, talking only on Talking Sopranos. Nowhere else, thank God. Um, Let's take a break and get into the episode. Take a break? All right. Let's take a break. All right, Michael, uh, here we are. Season 7, Episode 8. 8. The Blue Comet aired June 3rd, 2007. Written by Matt, uh, David Chase and Matt Warner. This is 12 of, of Matt Warner's 12. Another, uh, another great episode. Directed by Alan Taylor, the last of the nine that he did. Fantastic episode. You know, um, in Soprano tradition, following Soprano uh, tradition, the next to last episode had the shocking kill. Yeah. And uh, the shocking kill on this one, of course, is Bobby Bacala. Um, this is the last appearance of Steve Sharippa, Lorraine Bracco, John Ventimiglia, Kathy Narducci, Peter Bogdanovich. I mean, slowly, it's like, you know, you're peeling away the onion, and slowly, there's not that many people left. Not that many people left. Lorraine Bracco was nominated. Weird. Weirdly enough, she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for this episode. She lost to Katherine Heigl from Grey's Anatomy. But she was nominated for Best Actress three times prior. Yeah. This is the first time she was nominated for Supporting but maybe that was maybe that was her choice. Maybe that was her choice. Uh, the Blue Comet. Uh, they we took a break of two weeks before we aired this episode. So there was a like Memorial Day weekend. They didn't have an episode. It was a two week break. Eight million people watched this episode when it aired. It's the second uh, highest rated episode of that season. The Blue Comet itself was a train passenger train on New Jersey Central Railroad that ran from uh, uh, Penn Station to Atlantic City in the 30s, and uh, it's also there's a couple of apocalyptic mentions, apocalyptic references in this episode. And, and a blue comet, a comet often is a sign of some kind of disaster. And I think there's been ancient civilizations that talked about the comet being a harbinger of the end of the world and stuff like that. There's some references to that throughout that we'll get into at some point. It's a fantastic episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well written. It's got a little bit of everything. It really is good. Really and a dark good. one. It's dark. It's like you see, it's the end is nigh. You know what I mean? You can really feel it. So, uh, Stevie Van Zandt is exceptional in this one. Very uh, good. Very, I very think good. Stevie Van Zandt is, I think Silvio is dead. He uh, he was in a, well, we got to see the, I, I forgot the last episode. Which he's we'll in a coma, time. but I think he's dead. But I think he told David to put him in a coma in case there was a movie. He wanted to keep that open. He wanted to keep that I open. Think Smart David, thinking. I think David accommodated him there. We open up at Bert's house, played by Artie Pasquale. Uh, he picks up the newspaper. Silvio comes out of nowhere. 
He says, what are you doing? You scared the piss out of me. He says, uh, his wife is at mass. And uh, Silvio says, you know, some things you can't talk about over the phone. Now, apparently there was a scene that was cut. And I'm not sure if it was from this episode or the prior, where Bert actually tells Silvio he's talking to New York that kind of alluding to the fact that New York's going to be making some moves and trying to almost recruit Silvio. And really? apparently that got cut. Um, now, Bert is cousins with Carlo. They have the same last name. Carlo uh, played by Arthur Nascarella. I, so. I think, you know, I think Artie Pasquale's cousins with David Chase. With David Chase. But Gervasi, they both have the last name Gervasi. So yeah. I think there's a connection there. Obviously. Yeah, we don't there see that be. much of Bert in the series. Uh, we see him a little bit. Uh, you know, he was uh, making collections with Patsy in the one episode. Uh, and, and then here it comes. Uh, Silvio chokes Bert with a wire. The and most ruthless up. we've really seen, Silvio. Even more yeah. ruthless than with Adriana, because we really see him go through with all the. And it, and you it's know. Uh, you know, you know, uh, Bert puts up a fight. You got the dog there barking to add extra craziness, and you see Bert there lying dead. He's wearing white shoes like Holy. Wearing white shoes. Um, it's like very brutal. Tony, you know, he's you know. got the piano wire, whatever the hell he's got, the, the garrot. And, uh, you know, this episode opens right away with the murder. This is where we're at. We're wrapping things up with the show. You know, the evil has come home to roost. There's, you know, everybody's out for each other here. And uh, yeah, they, it's uh, a shocking they, killing. It's very, very, very violent. And you see Silvio, you know, it's not the warm, fuzzy Silvio we've gotten exactly. used to, but the he's the brutal the killer. Yeah. Now, didn't a guy in a restaurant or bar come up to you to t tell you how to choke a guy with a wire? Yes. I, I was at Rayo's with Paul, uh, Tony Sirico and Vinnie Pastor, and he was a member of the... I think he was a member of the uh, Colombo family. And he was giving a he was a tip. captain. He was a captain who had just gotten out of prison. He, was gonna uh, he gave me a tip. You. He's passed away since then, yeah. But he and did he give me a tip. He told you how to kill someone from He behind. said I could tell you the real way of how to do that. Yes. So that, that was a nice little tip he gave you. That was a nice tip. You yeah. never know when that comes in handy. You no, know, you, you, you never, never know. know and you, now I know. You never know when you got to choke a guy with a wire. It happens. It happens. It happens, you know. You never know. Who knows? Uh, we were at the Averna Social Club, which is uh, the Montequiera Bar on Mulberry Street. We were down there last week, me and you. You know, in that bar on Mulberry Street, in the window, there's a couple pictures of James Gandolfini and a huge blow-up of The Last Supper that Andy Leibovitz took of the Soprano family, uh, right, in the, uh, right in the window of the bar. Do you have that picture at home? I have it somewhere. You need to have that frame. Somewhere. That's a good one. It's beautiful. She did a great job with that. Yeah, you need to have that frame. Uh, Phil, he's made his decision. Historically, a combine, uh, what we said, the Sopranos are nothing more than a glorified crew. A crew. Plain and simple. We decapitate. We do business. What whatever's left, I'll be, uh, you know, he's against it at first. You're going to take out an entire family. And the famous lines, let me tell you a couple of three things. Forget Coco, Fat Dom, my brother Billy. Anthony Soprano has no respect for this thing, meaning the mob. He's a guy who stepped over his own uncle to grab the big seat. Yeah, he's talking about the lack of respect for the tradition, for the for the thing itself. When they made when they make guys, they don't prick their finger, they don't have a sword and a gun on the table, either it has meaning or not. He says the thing with Vito, that never got, you know, that was kind of a disgrace to the family. Uh, in the background, he sends away Pete Bucosi, who was our stunt coordinator. We've had him on the show. Ricky Aiello, who was also a stunt man. He was, uh, I worked with him on um, Life on Mars, son of Danny Aiello. Ricky passed away in, uh, earlier this year, this summer. Uh, he was a stuntman, he worked on Spike Lee's movies as well. Yeah, uh, very, really good guy. And also Dominic Kinese Jr. is also Dominic's son. My buddy Dom, he's in this scene. Uh, and the music you know, is Robert and Johnny. They were a doo-wop duo from the Bronx. We belong together. Uh, you know, uh, five families. And we got this pygmy thing over in Jersey. 
And of course, another famous line from the show uh, said by Phil Eutero, there's no scraps in my scrapbook. Make it happen. Make so it he happen. gives the order, make it happen. So he's basically said, you know, the plan is knock out Tony, Silvio, and Bobby, and then they'll just absorb the rest of the Soprano family into the Lucatazzi no family. Choice. Yeah. We know that Paulie's loyalty wavers, and he'll go whichever way the wind blows. He was already talking to Johnny Sack. And he wanted to talk to Carmine, and then he got humiliated because he realized Johnny was full of shit. So we know Paulie, and then really there's nobody else left after that, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, AJ in the hospital, AJ and Derek checking out a girl. Uh, She has cuts on her leg. Uh, Derek says, uh, you know, I saw her playing basketball. Uh, He says, it might first hard on in a month. He needs blue chew, Derek. If they had Blue Chew back then, he would be okay, Derek. I no? think the point is that they don't get hard ons because they're, you know, they want to keep them kind of subdued. In the yeah, hospital. what were they used to do in the uh, in the war? Give them salt, Peter? Wasn't that what it was called? Salt yeah, Peter? so they would not be. Uh, I guess so. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, is I it? think so. Yeah, I think so. Andy, did they give you salt, Peter, when you were in the war? Uh yeah, I think so. Uh, he gets up. He sees Rhiannon. Is that how you say Rhiannon. it? Rhiannon. Rhiannon. Uh, what are you doing here? She That's says, Emily Wickersham. We've had her on the show. She's great as Rhiannon. Terrific. Uh, she, yeah, played, have... she was Hernan. She was with Hernan, played by... Uh, Michael, um, uh, Michael... Vincent Piazza. It's, yes. She was, she was a girlfriend of Hernan. And uh, we've seen her before, and now she's in the hospital. She says that uh, she's there for food issues, depression. Hernan's a jerk. She caught him uh, finger-banging her cousin. She also says that now she's signed with Elite and doing some modeling. Yeah, that would be hard, uh, finger-banging on a ski lift. That's not an easy thing to do. You well, because it's so cold. You got to take off cold. your gloves. You got to take off the gloves and the thing. And Look, you're reaching over. You know, you're on the lift, the ski lift. Have you gone skiing? I'm sure you have. Long time ago. It's scary on the ski lift. You can fall out. Yeah, the whole thing is. I'm not a winter sports guy. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, somebody said you were modeling. She says, yes, I guess I signed with Elite. Uh, Susan asked, and then uh, Tony, they're signing in at the hospital, Tony and Carmela. Susan Aston was Jim Gandafini's credited as a dialect coach, acting coach, dear, dear friend. She's a wonderful acting coach. If you're here in New York and you need a good coach, look up Susan Aston, A-S-T-O-N, and they gave her a nice role here, and she does a good She's job. She's a very nice person. She also yes. spoke at Jim's funeral very lovingly yes. and, and, and uh, beautifully. She plays Evelyn here. Uh, she's basically saying he's doing well and hands them the bill for the, yeah. uh, they you know, uh, for the bill for the for the hospital, they see AJ. He's playing a video game. He kind of looks okay. I think they're they're not as concerned as they were. She needs and, an uh, avi- uh, the kids need a vitamin of calm, no stress. Uh, they give him the envelope, and he looks at it. He says twenty two hundred a fucking day. Twenty two hundred a day, and his insurance only pays ten percent of mental, so that's two grand he's got to put out a day. And that's 30 days, 60000 a month. That's a lot of money. That's ridiculous. I, I thought it was more like 30000 uh, uh, I think this is a real place that they're referring to in New Jersey, actually. Really? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, now I don't know if this is something. I know you're big on the conspiracy theories. Uh, he hits the button in the elevator. It's uh, number six. Yeah. Anything? Does that mean anything? Since, since something always means something, does he goes to the sixth floor mean anything? Well, 666 is the apocalyptic number of the beast, maybe. It could be. If he went to floor number 666, I really would have thought so. Yeah, I would imagine. So, pork store. But um, AJ is watching something called Metal, Metal, uh, Metalocalypse. Again, the apocalypse reference, the rapture, the end of days. The prior episode, Second Coming, that poem kind of refers to this almost apocalyptic rapture type of uh, Book of Revelations vibe. 
Are you into that? So you like all that crazy shit? Is that no, I don't. Into? I'm not into the Book of Revelations. I'm not a. I'm not a, a Christian or a, a Catholic. That's a. That's a. You know, the New Testament. I'm not into it. I, I don't know. I don't know what any of that means. I told you, I'm a simple fucking guy. I don't yeah, know what any I mean, of that. That's means. all a smokescreen. You're not a simple guy. We know. I it. don't know anything about anything. Any of these things. Nothing. I want to go watch the fucking Knicks play. That's all I want to do. I don't want to be. You? I'm going tomorrow night. I don't want. Well, you know what the fuck? Apocalypse, this, that, nonsense, nonsense. Tony sees Agent Harris. He walks over to him. He says, "How's the anti-terror thing?" He's talking about Ahmad and Muhammad. The guys. From but the he mentions Agent Harris. Mentions he, it's end times. Are you ready for the rapture? Again, another apocalypse reference. Tony orders a gobble goo provolone and vinegar peppers. By the way. That's a nice sandwich. I like vinegar peppers. That's a nice sandwich. Very nice sandwich. Uh, I hear there's a great sandwich place uh, called Charlie's in in Bay Ridge on 92nd Street. Supposed to be the best sandwiches. I I've never been or heard of it. I just heard the other day about it. Charlie's Deli. It's supposed to be out of this world. My favorite sandwich in the city, Postillos. Who's that? It's on Nassau Street. And I think they have another location now in Chelsea. But Postillo's on Nassau Street. They're Italians from Italy. They opened up in 2013. Michael, I'm telling you. And they have vegetarian sandwiches. I got to go. I'm telling you, I am not staring you wrong here. Seriously. Uh, Agent Harris likes the sandwiches over at Satrial's. And it doesn't look that good. Because Tony's eating it while he's talking to him, and he's disgusted by the news, so he throws it away. But it doesn't, it looks like a very ordinary sandwich. Yeah, it does. Maybe that was just a lapse in the you know, prop department that day. Who knows? He says, I, I'm not really sure. For all we know, they might be harmless pistachio salesmen. Uh, you know, don't get so bent out of shape. You're a big boy. Uh, you know, uh, Tony tells him to go fuck himself. He says, I told you about the problem with Brooklyn about a year ago. Well, it's on again, possibly. Yeah, maybe some people close to you. Well, he says there's a snitch that says the wheels are in motion. So who is that? Carlo. Carlo's a snitch. Carlo, He's... we find out, is a snitch in the next episode. No, Carlo's but some somebody is snitching from the New York side, saying the wheels are in motion to kill Tony Soprano. Who, uh, you know, who could it be? Or one of those guys in the back room there. Maybe. There's also uh, a shot now after Tony gets pissed off. Uh, there's a weird shot of Tony alone from the alleyway, almost as if he's being watched. It's a very kind of unsettling shot. You know, this episode is a very dark episode and very, uh, you know, the charm, the humor, the, the fun is gone. It's gone, but it's been gone. It's, it's been, been gone, gone and it's really gone in this one. The last episode, stage five, this episode, yeah, it's gone. You know, this is down to business. We're coming to the wire here. They got to wrap up 86 episodes in just a few. Yep. Basically. A lot of big back room. Tony's talking to Silvio. Tells him about Bert Gervasi. He's gone. Bert uh, let me know the other night. He's been talking, taking both sides of the fence with New York. Measures were taken. So Silvio killed Bert. I guess he doesn't need Tony's permission. Silvio's high enough up. He doesn't Silvio's have to get high permission. enough up. He was acting for the benefit of the family. I mean, I'm sure he's uh, guys are getting squeezed by New York. He tried to get Silvio. Um, you know, um, he was worried about. He didn't want to bother Tony because of AJ. He says. Bobby walks in. He saying we're talking about Phil. Tony says we got to hit first. Uh, Funny little thing here, little comment, uh, soprano style. When they first see Sylvia, he says, Krista fell off her shoes the other night. Had to call an ambulance, which is pretty funny. That is funny. Uh, Silvio uh, gives Tony a drink. Uh, you know, and then Tony sees Silvio did it himself. He's got the bandage on, you know, on his hand. He knows something went down. For Silvio, Tony eats with Silvio and Bobby. 
Uh, we got to hit first the stub tails with the other information I got. He's telling them what he heard from Agent Harris. I got, uh, you know, a target on my back. Silvio, it's a big move. Ask Bobby. Bobby is number three uh, right behind Silvio now. It's the console year, you know. And uh, then there's the music from Raging Bull. That's a Cavalieri Rusticana by Mascagni which is a famous opera. Usually it's done on a double bill with uh, Pagliacci. It's the intermezzo. So the opening of Raging Bull, the opening credits is black and white, of course. Slow motion of De Niro alone in the ring. Beautiful shot. This music is playing. It's very, it's just one of the great moments in cinema, to be honest. And uh, Scorsese was once asked, what will you take with you? You know, kind of like take to the grave. And he said, those frames, those opening frames of Raging Bull, because that's to him almost what he feels he is. Him against the world, Marty, you know, being an artist and trying to do his best and trying to do what he wanted to do and battling with the studios and trying to, you know, trying to make the best movies he could. And, and uh, those that sequence with this music playing and De Niro alone in the ring is particularly uh, meaningful to uh, Martin Scorsese. And it, it's, a, it is a beautiful sequence. And it's a, uh, it's very, what's that? This homage to, to him. Is that why David threw that in there? It's very funny. Silvio, you know, the slow I remember when we did that, Yeah, that was one of those moments when I, I said, this is the last time we're shooting here. I remember doing that scene and going, well, I, I only had a couple scenes left after that, you know, and that that was one of those moments. You know? That uh, that song also is in Godfather Three, by the way. It's it's used, been used in movies before. Um, he also calls you Buddha at one point, which yeah. you know, Buddha. There, there's a misconception. There's a statue of people think is Buddha this chubby uh, monk. It's not Buddha. It's the happy monk. Buddha is never depicted as chubby in any iconography I've ever seen. That's a misconception that Buddha was fat, Buddha belly and all that shit. That's a total, I think, an American uh, Western misconception of uh, Buddha. Really? Yeah. Have you seen pictures of the real Buddha? They didn't have photographs uh, 2,500 years ago, Steve. They didn't? No, they didn't. Not a drawing? There's drawings. That's what I'm saying. There's iconography. There's drawings. There's, there's, you know, uh, I don't know if they were made close to that time period, but the drawings that exist of Buddha, what be it uh, Tibetan Buddhism or Indian or Nepali or even uh, Japanese or Chinese or Thai, that there's no fat Buddha. It's a fat. It's a chub. It's a happy monk statue that people so kind of assumed was Buddha. So you think this is just a souvenir that they saw? No, he might have some significance as this happy monk, but people kind of misconstrued him as Buddha, his, you know, gotcha. over time. Gotcha. Flatbush bikini waxing and beauty. Flatbush bikini wax. Get it? Flatbush bikini wax. <laughs> Flatbush is a neighborhood in Brooklyn, for those yes. of you that don't know. Butch meets with Albie, Dominic, and Ray Ray. Uh, three pops with a tight time frame, 24 hours. So there's no chance for them to hit back. Top three guys. Tony, obviously, Silvio, and Bobby Bacala. Ray Ray says the Mortadella is number three. He used to be Junior's driver. And I'll be snaps at him. He used to sell laser printers out of the back of your Crown Vic. He also says, what about Paulie Walnuts? And uh, Galtieri says, no, only management. And then what's, what's weird in this scene, then Butch starts like putting away hair products. So is he a hairdresser? I mean, what is that? Maybe he owns the shop. Yeah, it's weird. Maybe he owns the shop. He owns the shop. In Flatbush, yeah. Maybe, uh, you know. He's waxing bushes. He's See, flattening bushes in Flatbush. <laughs> uh, soprano Kitchen, Carmelo Romero are in the kitchen. AJ comes downstairs. Meadow, you really slept. I can't find my belt. Carmela took his belt away, obviously. Uh, do you want oatmeal? Again, babying him still. Or do you want the real thing or half and half? She does it in a very annoying sing-songy voice. But he wants it. Yeah, I understand that. So you're going to keep doing that, too. I know she feels bad for him, but you know what I mean. 
Yeah, she's uh, doing it, and he's allowing it. And then he goes to watch something. It looks like about the Iraq, uh, Iraq war, suicide bombers, IEDs. You know, he's obsessed with violence. You know, I think, uh, especially after what he saw. You know, the the African guy get beat up by his friends. He's just um, he's kind of consumed with it and terrorism. AJ he's obsessed. Really, really gone off the rails. He's messed up. Yeah, he's messed up. He really is. Out of big back room, Bobby plays pool. Silvio shines his shoes. You know, that's one of them shoe shiner that spins. I don't know if that really works. Shoe buffer? Yeah, I, I think that's a bullshit thing. You do? <laughs> it's like, it's like. remember the old days, uh, they would have that thing. The exercise belt? The exercise belt. That, uh, that's bullshit. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah, they had one. My grandfather had one in the basement. Yeah. We used yeah, to yeah. do it, my brother and I, when we were kids, just for fun, you know. It's a, but, I, I, that's supposed to make you lose weight. It's ridiculous. It's a scam. <laughs> it absolutely is <laughs> a scam. And I think this shoe shine thing is a scam. I could be wrong. Uh, regarding our friend with the gray hair, I thought about it. I want you to call Italy, get some covers. He wants to bring people from Italy over to kill Phil. Right. And Bobby says, well, do you want to run the thing? He just looks back at Bobby. Bobby's going to be in charge of this. He's come a long way, Bobby Bacala. He has, yeah. Dinner party, very highbrow. Highbrow. Most of them, it seems, are shrinks. Uh, yeah. You know, psychiatrists, psychologists getting together. Uh, Peter Benedict plays Ken at the, uh, He. it looks like it might be his house. That was David Chase's agent at UTA. Oh, really? Yeah. He does a good job. He does a good job there, yeah. He does big, a good big, job. Big agent for you. I, I, I don't know if he's still with uh, United Talent, but a big Hollywood agent. Good he guy. I've met him job. a few times. I liked him a lot. I would hate to be at this dinner party. Hate you it. would hate that, yeah. Hate it. They're so talking hate. about how some Bonus. therapists uh, have fascination with criminals. We think it's a rescue fantasy. Um, well, this is from the last... This is the, from the last episode. episode. Now, this study uh, by by Yochelson and uh, Samarau, uh, Samanau, whatever the name is, is a real study that came out that David saw around this time or maybe before this time when they were writing the episodes. And I think it really had an effect. Robert Hare did another study talking about sociopaths glibly engage in issues, mother, family, you know, um, that the talking cure makes them better criminals. And then, and then Melfi says, well, who's a true sociopath? And someone says, well, I had a slow poisoner in a state asylum who would mimic empathy, blubber, and cry. And then Melfi confronts Kupferberg here and just realizes that he's been blabbing about her patient. Yeah. And he is totally out of line and says, you should reevaluate reevaluate your work with Lead Belly or you're going to deal with more moral and possibly legal consequences. Really out of line, really putting her on the spot, embarrassing her, breaking confidence. And then he says, well, it's a, they all wonder who he's talking about, who's lead belly. And he says, it's a, think female opera singer, gangster. And then he hums the Jeopardy theme. Yeah. Written by Merv Griffin, by the way, the Jeopardy theme. You knew that, right? Yes. yes. He made tons of money off the Jeopardy theme. Did you know that? Well, he's tons. made tons of money off, uh, he has other game shows he invented, didn't he? Invent but the theme them? song alone, he made a lot of money. I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, Kupferberg is way, way, way out of line. They figure out it's Tony Soprano, and he's telling her to chill out. We're you know, a month before uh, it's, professional. It's fascinating work, and she says, it is fascinating. Cut to, there he is in the Bing, Tony Soprano. Uh, the doors when the music's over, uh, um, you know, coming you to missed, an end, the music's over. You out on something. One of them say uh, the wine was great. I think uh, Ken says the wine was great. And uh, somebody says all Italians have big noses. Yeah, she, uh, before that, they ask her to, uh, that they say she's the Italian wine expert. And then she says, if I would have made that joke about another ethnic group, referring to Jews, obviously, she says, uh, uh, at pe at this table, ethnic group at this table, I'd be considered a bigot. Yeah. Terrible. Uh, Kupperberg's an asshole. He shows it here. We, Way out of we line. We kind of knew that Horrible. already. We kind of knew that. 
but uh, he really shows his true colors. Here. Horrible, yeah. Uh, Paulie's at the bar with Carlo and Anthony. Bobby comes. He says something in his ear. Bobby and Paulie go into the. You know what I whispered in his ear? Beautiful wings today, Tony. Did you really? Yeah. Beautiful wings today. He said they contacted the Zips. Zips is a uh, kind of derogatory for like um, Italians you know, from Italy that are yes. in America. Yeah, Correct. They're coming over from Naples. You contact the guy to contact the guys. Phil's at his gomadas every Friday night, Bobby says. Uh, you know, uh, I know, uh, does T know about this? He questions and Bobby gets pissed. Yeah. Bobby gets pissed because he feels like Bobby's, you know, kind of going over his head here. Uh, but really, he's expressing concern that this is going to cause a war. He says, I got through the, you know, the Colombo War by the skin of my nuts. He was referring to the war in the 1970s, Joe Colombo, Joe Gallo. A lot of people died, and he's worried. Now, do you think he's worried because of this, you know, the cost and the stakes of a mob war, or he's worried because he's already kind of playing both sides here with New York and Jersey. You know, uh, I think really he's worried that, listen, I mean, uh, there's people going to die here and he could very well be one of them. You know, uh, we have no proof that it's him, but he said there could be a line of Casarelli's, which is the funeral parlor in Jersey a mile long. So people are going to die. They get into a war, you know what's going to happen. You know. Sure. He called uh, Bobby, watch your fat fucking mouth. That wasn't very nice. I don't think that was nice. Dr. Milton's nice, bedroom. No. She's reading the uh, study in bed. Uh, that they Sentimentality about. for babies and pets. Criminal uses insight to justify heinous acts. And right here, that, that line, for criminal's therapy becomes one more criminal operation. Those two lines, criminal uses insight to justify heinous acts. In some, in some respect, you know, remember this series, back in the pilot, open with Tony and therapy. Yeah. And here we are almost at the end of the line of this series, and we're coming to this conclusion. Criminal uses his insight to justify heinous acts. So what are we left with? We're left with Tony Soprano committing heinous acts, using the therapy as a justification. It's almost like a um, this whole thing was a you know an exercise in in uh, failure. Do you think Tony got anything useful out of therapy? That's a really good question. That's, a, that's another thing I'd like to ask David Chase, Andy. Put that on the list. You know, when this show first went overseas, it was a big hit in a lot of places, but not in Italy. And the Italians didn't even watch it because they felt the idea of a mafioso in therapy did not make sense to them. It has since become a big show in Italy, and, and, they get, and they, it's beloved there now. But they really resisted it because that didn't make sense to them. And this scene... And this study and the conclusion that Melfi's coming to kind of is in line with that. Yeah. Bada bing, Paulie sits next to Patsy at the bar. Corky arrives. But he says uh, to him, don't worry about them. They're going to be okay. And I think Paulie, I think Patsy's worried about his kids, his sons. Will they try shit? Yeah. Will they try shit against my kids? What's, what, what happens? How far do they go in a war? Who knows? He tells, uh, what he tells Corky. What the fuck are you talking so loud for? Uh, they go to the bathroom. Paulie talks to Patsy. So he passes it off. It's all yours. So P Patsy's in charge of carrying this out with the Italians. These are the guys who killed Rusty. The, they came over from Naples, the same two guys. Italo, uh, Italo and Roberto. Ah. Yeah. Well, there's one of them. One of them. The other guy's different. I don't think so, really. Yeah, because the one guy played the Italian guy in Seinfeld uh, at the pizzeria. And he's not there? No. Andy, check on that. No, there's the one guy, but not the other guy. There's only one. Tony rips out the page about a steak recipe from a magazine. Departures uh, magazine. That's uh, American Airlines gives you that if you're in first class. It's do you know a luxury that lifestyle magazine. There's not many magazines. You know, a lot of these doctors are saving money now because there's not that 
People don't buy magazines. They don't read magazines. It's all online. A lot. I went into a magazine store on Mulberry Street the other day. There was thousands of magazines in there. And really, because I haven't been in a magazine store in a while, I was shocked to see how many magazines there are. Yeah, but they, I don't think they buy them. in the. You go into the uh, doctor's office, they don't have them much anymore. Was it maybe because of COVID? It could be. Could very, very well be. But uh, Tony's it's a steak- recipe for steak, uh, a Basque pepper. Basque region is between in the mountains between Spain and France. Uh, Espelette peppers is, a, I guess, a pepper from that region. It's a recipe for steak. You know, Tony says uh, to Melfi, Tony, she's not going to be a doctor, Meadow. It's kind of sad, isn't it? It's a nice thing to be, helping sick babies. I mean, all the worrying, which private school, Columbia. Sick it's, babies is exactly what she was, you know, reading in, in the study. That yeah. You know, empathy for babies and stuff like that. Uh, after a couple of years in the workforce, she says, I'm still working. Yeah, but, you know, he, you know, he, he, really stupid. Thing. And in the end, she'll get married, squeeze out some kids. After what? A couple of years in the workforce? I'm still working. But you're divorced. I mean, it's a, a very strange conversation here. And, and, Mel, and Melfi's had enough. You could tell early on. She's just had enough. You know, he's really hurting AJ. Forget he is hurt. Maybe I should have uh, just, and she cuts him off, put his shoe, put your shoe up his ass. Yeah, frankly. You know, that's his. You know, yeah. re, you know, he could get him out of the depression, he thinks, by a little bit of tough love, forceful. You know, I think AJ's too far gone for that, you know. Yeah, and he's being like kind of, he's kind of full of shit here. You know, the cry, you know, he's almost getting teary eyed talking about AJ. It's a fake sympathy. Uh, he's about to say, My old man. And she says, Are you a shining example? Basically, from your old man, you know, uh, you know, your old man did. Was that good what he did? Look at you. You're a killer. You're a thief. You know, she kept talking about his old man would have did this or that. But how good was his old man's child rearing? Yeah. She's, she puts it, he's never cared about anything, but now he cares too much. And your daughter, like all females, disappoints. She's calling him to the carpet, basically yeah. saying. Oh, yeah. You know. She's had enough. This is a yeah. breakup. This is a breakup coming. It's like when. You're breaking up with a girl or a guy. And it Everything all comes, comes out. out. This and is all out. I, this has been building up for years. He talks about it's 2,200 a day. And she uh, brings up the magazine. You don't care. You know, you know, you don't, your thought, you're, you know, you're, you don't think about other people. Maybe someone else wants to read that. And she says, I don't think I can help you. Boom. Tells him it's not the first time. He says, I'm chalking this all up to female menopausal situations. Which is just the wrong thing to tell a woman or a girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. You know, so those guys, what are you on your period? You know, those guys, you know, that is just the wrong fucking thing to say. She calls them. She says, there's a new big thing. Psychodynamic therapy uh, combined with Anifril could be very effective for you. I can recommend another doctor. She says, you don't give a shit about your commitments. You just do whatever the fuck you want to do. Uh, and he says the thing about menopause. He, she says, you're not my gynecologist. And he says, you don't need a gynecologist to know which way the wind blows, which is a take on Bob Dylan's lyric from Subterranean, Home, Subterranean Homesick Blues. You don't need a, a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. He tells her what she's doing is immoral, which is just laughable. Everything yeah. Tony does is immoral. Everything he does. As a Every doctor, I think thing. this is a, he tries the pity card too. He tries the pity card saying, You're gonna cut me loose just as my son's getting out of the hospital. Yeah. Uh we're so basically the- he's he's uh you know, demonstrating all these things in that study. Yeah. And really it's becoming very clear, however hard it is for her to hear from Kupferberg, it's true. She believes it now. Do you really think he went in there, though, and said, I'm going to go to therapy and I'm going to hone my con man skills? Or it no, just happened? I, it's not conscious. That's just who they are. Yeah. They do it because that's who they are. You know, well, you, like know that the, old, you know that old, you know that old, what is that? It's an old fable, like the scorpion and the yeah. the frog or something. Yeah, that, if you take them over the... the he in carries the, the scorpion on his back, and the scorpion stings him. He's like, "What are you doing?" Now we're both going to drown. He's like, "Well, I'm a scorpion. That's what I do." Yeah. You know. Yeah. 
Uh, is that in The Sopranos? That's an episode, right? They talk about that. The scorpion and the what is it? Frog. I think it was, maybe it was mentioned here. I've heard it several times. We're at the Gamada's house. Uh, that was in Middle Village in Queens. That's where that's is that yeah. Queens or Brooklyn Middle Village? Queens. Queens. That's where that was shot. We're at the uh, Soprano house. I mean, we're at the the Gamada's house. Phil's Gamada's house. Uh, the 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 her father looks. You know, somewhat similar. Similar age, Phil. the gray hair, kind of the same stature. He says uh, DHL Express, like a FedEx. Uh, he's got the fake box. He kills the father, thinking it's Phil, and he kills the Gomado, comes down screaming. And Daddy, the stunt, stunt woman does an amazing yeah. fall down those stairs. Very scary and very, very real. Uh, Corky's in the porn video store. Uh, he calls him up. They're speaking Italian. It's done. We're leaving. The woman got mixed up in the two. She's gone. His daughter. His daughter. What would she be doing at his mistress's house? And he realized something's wrong. She called him daddy. Let me ask you. Does your friend speak your Ukrainian? Well, then he calls Patsy and says that. He says, it's done. The Gumar is dead. But does your friend speak Ukrainian? Yeah. Patsy says, what the fuck do I know? He assumes it's done anyway, and he calls Paulie. Patsy calls Paulie and tells him it is done. They fucked up is what they did. They really fucked up. They fucked this, up. This was bad. Vesuvio, Tony eats with Carmella. Uh, listen, I, Tony, I quit therapy, and she agrees. He lies. Uh, you know. Yeah, of course, he's lying. Listen, if he's talking, he's lying. <laughs> Except for that slight improvement around the shooting, she wasn't doing you much good anyway, Carmella says, right? Charmaine and Artie come in. Uh, so Meadow was here with uh, Patrick Parisi, very happy. Is it true what she said? She's quitting pre-med. And, uh, of course, Carmella has to save face here. You know, uh, and Tony, too. You know, with the AIDS. Uh, we're so relieved. No, they're not relieved. They wanted her to be a doctor. What is she going to do now? Not just law. She says constitutional law. And they're almost kind of uh, happy. You know, you see that jealousy. Charmaine's a little happy she's not going to be oh, a yeah. doctor. You know what I mean? There's that oh, little yeah. dig. And, you know, Carmela wants to, you know, she's got to show off constitutional law. What about AJ? How's he doing? He's good. He's good. You know, uh, you know who's there tonight? The Mangini, I guess. I remember when he was there on the set. I was there for some reason. That day. He was the coach of the Jets. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's the last uh, appearance of Artie Bucco and Charmaine? Uh, Carmella is a little cool, doesn't uh, uh, Charmaine mentions, isn't it a little awkward that Patsy still works for Tony, and yet the kids are going out, which oh, we mentioned. yeah. That's not really that awkward, is it? A little bit. And they're in the mob. It's one thing if you worked in a, you know, a different job. Kids get together. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Does Patsy get preferable treatment now? You know? Yeah, maybe. She, she says, you know, when Cupid lands, blah, blah, blah. Bada bing, Sylvia, Sylvia sitting with a dancer. All he arrives, uh, you don't answer your fucking phone. You can pass the word upstairs. The gray goose is gone. He's saying Phil's gone. Apparently, the good mother had to be taken out, too. They make a comment about her behavior at the Jersey Boys party. I guess she was drunk and out of line. And it makes uh, Paulie think of his ma, who died uh, after what? On the bus after on Jersey bus. Boys. Like a dog on that bus. Uh well, then Murma shows Paulie and Silvio a newspaper. Who does this look like? And they look very similar. And they realize Phil's not dead, basically. And Silvio tells Paulie, oh, you're going to make Tony very happy with this news. Right. But after they see that newspaper, they, both, Absolutely. they know. They know it's uh, it didn't Soprano happen. house. Tony's empty in the pool. Janice arrives. Got a call, Uncle Junior's account, the one with the artificial voice box. They always got to throw something in there. Says he's been trying to reach you for two weeks. He's out of money. Uh, you know, he can't pay the, the White Cough psychiatric. Junior thinks the guy with the, the artificial voice box is from outer space, which is kind <laughs> of 
bizarre. Janice also, when she's she's coming outside, she's leaving the baby with uh, the kid with Carmela, and she says, "Good girls don't cry, babies cry." She's just uh, horrible, tough, yeah. tough, 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 she, tough. She's uh-huh. Olivia, Olivia in training. Uh, Tony offers Janice five dollars here. He says, why don't you guys take care of it if you're so concerned? She says, well, we don't have that kind of money. No, but she says they'll kick in something, but we don't have that kind of money. And Tony doesn't give a shit. And he's pissed. Uh, He tells her Bobby betrayed him. He feels sorry for Junior. Junior tried to kill him, right? Tried to kill him. Bobby, we know, which Tony doesn't even know that he went to see him. Remember when Bobby went to see him? He doesn't even know that. And he makes a reference, exile on Main Street. He says, Bobby is now exile on Main Street. That's a our is, famous album by the Rolling Stones. And is that, who's exile? Bobby? Bobby. Junior? That's it. He's pissed off at Bobby for taking Junior, you know, for not just standing beside, behind Tony on this this uh, issue. He takes out five dollars. He gives it to a Soprano Garage. Tony and Silvio arrive. Paulie says he... He wants it known it's on him. He takes full responsibility, but that he didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is great. Full responsibility, it, but that he didn't have nothing to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, nobody. I mean, nobody knows where the fuck Phil is four or five days now. So we never really had a shot at him. He puts everything in place. He moves on. Goes into hiding, waits it out. He says, uh, he go on the ground. That's what they call it. And Tony says, who calls it that? He says, well, it's an expression, going to ground. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. You have? Yeah. I think it's a military thing, maybe. Okay. Uh, and he says, tell everybody to be careful. This is, they, you know, the stakes have really gone, because they know Phil is going to know that they tried to kill him, and Phil already was ready to kill everybody, so the stakes are going way, way high here. You got to you got to warn, get at the word to everybody. Eyes in the back of your head, break routines, collections, all that shit. In the meantime, we keep trying. Get a twenty on Phil. He he tells Silvio, let everyone know to be careful. Yeah. Train land in Lindbrook, Long Island. Lindbrook, that's our friend John uh, Manieri from uh, was the host. Bobo. The maitre d' at, at Bobo, Bobo Restaurant. I, I, wonder, I haven't been to Bobo in a long time. I wonder if he's still there. One of good, the best restaurants in the city, yeah. Great guy. A good actor. He's done a lot of work, John. Uh, he's the maitre d' there, John Maneri, if you still see him. A terrific guy. Uh, now, I shot this uh, after I got killed. That Then I shot. So the shooting was first, then you shot the scene with John. Yeah, he's, about a, about he's showing a month you later. the the blue comet. Uh, it's a whole set. No, of- no, 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 no. Bobby gets out of his car. He walks to the store. You that shot that scene later. I shot about a month later. No, oh, okay. Inside the store was all. That was all one day. So one he's showing half, you one and a half day. He's showing you this set. Blue Comet. It's an antique. It's an old one, obviously. There's a, it's in great condition. There's the Pullman, the, the club car. It's eight grand. It's a lot of money. Bobby must be doing okay. Yeah, and Bobby's wearing a blue shirt, just like the Blue Comet. Which I, I have what... that. I have a couple of those. You have that shirt. I have that uh, shirt. Interesting, interesting way to shoot this scene. Very atypical for the Sopranos. You know, usually when there was a killing, shooting, it was very much kind of cut and dry. This is very elaborate. It, there's shots from the train's POV, intercut the train, going around the tracks with the killers moving through the stores. Bobby sees the killers. They come at him. The inter- it's, it, it's almost very Hitchcock, the way they kind of um, shot and cut this scene very uh, different than normal for The Sopranos. Um, and it's a great sequence. They shoot Bobby 15 times. 15 bullets, man. Was it that many times? Yeah, 15. I had, the, I had the squibs all, you know, crappy feeling. You get that shit all over you. you yeah. Know, the, the fake blood. Uh, Bobby says if that train still ran New York to AC, Atlantic City would be a much different place today. So Bobby liked this train thing. It was kind of him 
you know, uh, it allowed him to kind of think about a simpler time. He had nostalgia for it. It relaxed him. It was his real, he was really into it. Riding in a club car, sipping a Negroni. Why don't you do that, Trains? Why don't you get into that? I'm surprised after doing The Sopranos, you didn't take that up as a hobby. Nothing. Seems something really good for you. Chill you out, calm you down. I need something. I need yeah. something. Yeah. Because I'm on the fucking, I'm standing on the ledge, Michael. On the I fucking know. ledge. And you're not, you're not drinking that much. You're not no. That, you know, no um, I wish I was. Maybe that's not. the, maybe I got to start drinking again. Uh, but uh, he says your son is going to love it. Bobby says I'm going to go for it. He, uh, uh, he says your son is going to love it. He said he don't care because uh, Bobby Jr. doesn't care about that. Uh, a Negroni is gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari. Did you used to like that when you were Yeah. There? Have you had that? It's, it's yeah. an Italian drink. Yeah, it's great. Now, uh, the guys come in. Actually, my a- first date with uh, Victoria, we went to the Art Bar. Art Bar is on 8th Avenue near, um, it's near like 13th Street over there. Uh, Jim used to love the Art Bar. He used to go there a lot. I went there with him a few times. That was our first date, and that's what we drank. The Gronies. Yeah. And is it still there, the Art Bar? I think so, yeah. Really? Yeah. And it's on 8th or on 13th? It's on 8th Avenue, yeah, which oh, really? is kind of, uh, Hudson kind of becomes 8th. Yeah. Around there. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know where that little square is? Uh-huh. There's a little park there where, where Greenwich Avenue meets 8th Avenue. I think it's 13th Street. They all kind of converge. It's right below that on 8th Avenue. Yeah, I've never been there. They, you know, they, the two killers come in. They come in shooting. Uh, he's got the train in his hand. Uh, you see the little statues as the train's going to keep cutting back Bobby to the train. The statues have hands. The little figurines have their hands over their mouth. I don't know if you caught that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, right. You caught that. Uh, there's a new one. Bobby Friendly, you know, they shoot him. He's dead. He falls into the train uh, above his head as he's dead on the floor. With his eyes open, you see Newark. Mm. Newark sign. I did the whole stunt. Myself, all the shooting, I didn't do, that was not me falling into the train set. No. That was somebody else. Uh, they only had two setups. I was afraid I would fuck it up. So I let the stunt guy do his thing. Uh, also, I didn't want to hurt my back. So, uh, and he did it in one shot, which looks, it looks great. Great. It's and, a, it's uh, a great sequence. It's very, yeah. it's very disturbing. It's very tense. It's, it's, uh, it's great. Well, you really the, well done. You got the kids uh, crying, yelling, uh, bought a big back room. I, you know, I ran into one of the kids who's now older. I ran into him somewhere, him and his father. The shooter? No. no. Oh, the guy I, who's there with the father, the kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I ran into them. Bought a big back room. Silvio talks to Patsy. Silvio's packing up the bags quickly. Uh, I'm going to be working away from the office. I should have this stuff. You don't want to make yourself useful. Get the girls' pay slips over there. They're getting out of Dodge. Patsy and Sylvia are getting out in a hurry. Uh, Bada bing, Sylvia gets in Patsy's car. PDB and Ray Ray pull in front of them. Uh, They start shooting. Sylvia's shot. Lies in the car. The Bada bing crew comes out, watches. Some of the girls are top. They came right off stage, yeah. They came off stage. They come running, watching. Uh, PD and J- uh, Ray Ray drive away. They hit a motorcycle. It's a great stunt. That stunt man. The motorcycle on the goes motorcycle. sliding. The guy goes get, goes sliding down the highway and gets hit by a car. It's very disturbing. It's very messy and crazy. Uh, Silvio's unconscious. Patsy gets away and is running through the uh, the trees there in the little creek behind the Bada Bing. He's he's getting away. Soprano house. Here comes uh, Dante, played by our dear friend Anthony Rubastello, who's passed on. Uh, he's got guns. He tells him to sit here. He'll be right out. He goes in. You got Rosalie there, looking at pictures from Paris, with Carmelo laughing and reminiscing about their vacation there. 
Yeah, and there's a photo of them kind of, you know, when they're behind one of those backdrops, and it seems yeah. like a Marie Antoinette thing, and maybe there's that's a reference to, you know, uh, the French Revolution, you know, the danger that's, you know, Carmela as the queen, you know, uh, the danger that people are coming after her as well, her and the king, Tony. I think that might be a little reference to that there. You know, they should have that uh, with people. They should have uh, cut out Talking Soprano. Us. Of us, and then they could put their head where my face they, is. The Talking Soprano logo. logo. They could what do, do you it. think? They should do that. It's a great idea. I think people would where like Where are they going to do it, though? I don't know. <laughs> Look, I don't have all the fucking answers. I have ideas. I'm an idea man. I mean, but where are they going to do that? Like on a, on a corner somewhere in New York? On a corner I mean, somewhere. Where? You know, like they do. You ever see these people uh, in the village? It's the outside of the friend's house. You know, friend's apartment. Where? It's on Bedford. It's on Bedford in the village, and it's the outside of the friend's apartment. What was it? A townhouse? No, apartment building. And you Bedford know, Bedford and what? Near uh, like Bleecker over there. Uh, the other side of Seventh Avenue. Near, near, not Bleecker. Near. Uh, there's, there's a restaurant right downstairs, and uh, they people come there. Constantly from all over the world to take pictures of the apartment building, and oh, they have a. There's a guy there who has a cutout of the different characters, and you could take a picture, a cutout picture with the character with the apartment building behind. Well, there's a um, the house where the Sex in the City, Carrie Bradshaw's house, is a townhouse on Perry Street. They put a chain in front of the. St- the stoop because people were going on the stairs all the time they to take pictures. So they put a yeah. chain, but people that would walk by there uh, uh, two days ago. It was people outside yeah. taking pictures. Yeah. And there's one on Bedford in the village, and it's uh, outside of the Friends, which is very popular. So Friends was set. I thought it was uh, L.A. No, no, no. It was set in New York. I've never seen Friends. It was shot in L.A. though. It was shot in L.A. Yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah. I'm one of brothers on the lot. You know, it's a sitcom on the lot, but. Uh, somebody had a way to make some money. Five bucks, they let you use their cutout. Not a bad deal. So maybe we should do that. A cutout of you. Maybe we should do that. I think I think you're right. I think you're How about a cutout right. of Andy? A cutout of Andy. Think people would go for that? A cutout of Andy? Yeah, take a picture with Andy. After today's episode, they may. Yeah. yeah. Uh so he, he comes in. Can I talk to you for a second? Bobby's dead. He's shot. Sills in the hospital. Carmela's panicking. He's trying to keep her under control. Uh, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, what does this mean? You mean that they're, you know, they are they after you? She's panicking, and rightfully so. We should split up. You and the kids go. I'll be somewhere else. Uh, families don't get touched. You know that now. Ah, uh, you know that might be a little insight into the finale. That yes, if they sir. kill, if they kill Tony, they want to kill the other three. That is true, right? Uh, he says, "Look, it's a precaution." Uh, she says, hey, you know, "AJ's got to go. How are you going to get him to go along? You won't leave the house." Uh, and he, Carmela Spanaki, he's heated. He knew someday. This day was going to come. He's trying to keep Carmela calm. AJ's room, he sits down like a man and tries to, he tells uh, Rhiannon, whatever the fuck her name is, Emily Wickersham's character. How's that? Rhiannon, you were right. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's looking at the laptop. AJ's lying in the bed. He says, leave us alone. Matter of fact, you go. Hang downstairs. He says, you bust in. He sits him down. She's trying to talk to him like a man. I need you to cooperate here. I need you to help your mother. Whatever she needs, don't break her balls. Uncle Bobby's dead. Uh, and AJ completely falls apart. He says, we all need to leave. He goes, this is so depressing. I'm, I'm already having trouble maintaining. And Tony just loses patience there and just grabs Grab him, him, drags him across the floor, throws the bag at him, pack a bag. He, he That's it. It's time to man up. That's Tony's attitude. Enough of this coddling bullshit. You know, 
death, you know, that he's protecting them from dying. You know, that's very dangerous and he's just not seeing it. Uh, AJ uh, is hysterical. Tony's looking at the computer. On the computer, it says global terrorism analysts. That's what him and uh, the girl are looking at. He's obsessed with all that stuff, the, the Janice, Iraq war, terrorism and stuff. Janice's house, Janice sits with Bobby Jr. and Sophia, Carmela and Meadow arrive. Janice kind of in shock a little. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Short scene, but he, and just in that little moment, Aida conveys so, so much. She's just perfect in this the scene. The kids are just, just nothing. You know, they're just probably in shock. Uh, Bobby was a loving father. The kids loved him. Now they're stuck with Janice for the time being. Yeah. That ain't going to be pretty. No. Soprano house. Paulie locks the doors. He's locking things up. I called the hospital. They won't give us information on Silvio. Uh, Gabe's brother finally fell back. Doctors don't think he'll recover consciousness. He's in a coma. They go both go into the kitchen. Uh, Tony is starting to... Uh, they got garbage, uh, plastic garbage bags. They're starting to get supplies together. You know, they're canned goods, starting to get stuff out of the cupboards. He knows he's, uh, they're going underground here. Going to the mattresses, like they said going in The, the Godfather. Mattresses. And literally, you see a mattress uh, at the safe up, house. Uh, yeah, garbage bags. Uh, Paulie always has to say so something stupid. Look at uh, the stems on Blondie. In the middle of this crisis. Safe house, Dante and Tony walk into the back of the house. Carlo, Paulie, and Walden park in the front. Uh, they're all going to stay. Tony says, you go, you know, take care of, I guess, his mother or his wife. We're going to stay. They're figuring out where they're going to bunk. Carlo says, uh, you want to order a pizza, which I find odd. I find that odd. They're underground. How do they know that the pizza delivery guy isn't well, going to call somebody? Maybe they're going to go pick it up. Yeah, you know what I mean? But they might go pick up the pizza. Uh, right? I guess. But still, yeah. not a good idea to be seen. They no. should just cook. Uh, they he got wants weapons. To order a pizza. No vegetarian. Set up there. Tony's alone in the dark there in the bedroom. He's got an automatic rifle uh, on the mattress. There's no sheet there, but uh, he is... You know, it's a dark, very foreboding moment feeling. They flash back to the Soprano Home Movies episode on the lake in the boat. Bobby says, you probably don't hear it when it happens. Now, is he referring to Bobby's death or maybe Tony in the last episode or Silvio's? We don't know. That we don't know. That. And it ends with the Tinder Sticks uh, instrumental uh, running wild. Tinder Sticks, of course, the uh, Sopranos used it, Tiny Tears, their song, to great effect in the Isabella episode. Very, very when. eerie, very eerie music. Now, there's a cutout of Sylvia uh, in the background in the house, and it's the writers wanted Sylvia to have a presence in the scene, even though he was in the hospital. So they made that cutout to appear to be a part of being promotional item being fought at the same Where's that? I want to know where that is. Yeah. But probably Stevie has it. Uh, and don't forget, the gun that Tony is holding is the one Bobby got him for his birthday. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. Uh, and the music is just the perfect music. You know what gets me with David? You know, sometimes it's, so you know, Italian music and Frankie Valley and, you know, stuff more mainstream. Then there's rap. I mean, David, you know, there's, in some scenes, there's rap music. There's all kinds these, of music. Oh, 50s, it's just doo -wop, incredible. everything. Classical, opera, we got everything. It is just incredible. Now, this is it, Michael. We're down to one more episode. Can't believe it. We have one more episode, man. Do you know, by the end of the day, we, we've analyzed like 2,500 scenes? It's by amazing. the end of the whole thing, yeah. It's amazing we're still talking to each other. Amazing. So next week, uh, we would not, we're not doing the finale next week. Next week is uh, our second volume two of, of uh, super Soprano fans. Super Fans. And we have some great Super Fans. We're going to get our Super Fans to tell us what they think happens at the end of the Sopranos, which that's yes. going to be kind of fun. It's going to be um, a lot of fun. But now it's time 
for the Talking Sopranos Ask Me Anything segment, the winner of our AMA Best Question is Stacy from New Orleans, Louisiana, and we're going to send Stacy a pair of Bose headphones. So Stacy asks, I watched the show from day one, and 20 years later, it continues to grow bigger and bigger. More people talk about it. There are fan accounts on Instagram and Facebook, conventions, etc. What do you think about the fans who watch the show on a seemingly continuous loop? Well, I mean, there's a lot of them. I hear from tons of them who rewatch all the time. I mean, I've met so I met somebody recently who rewatched it like, I mean, like an absurd amount of times. I forgot even what she said, but just like constantly. And I think it's oddly enough because the show, you know, can be pretty dark and pretty violent and pretty disturbing. Um, there's something comforting when something becomes beloved and familiar. There's something comforting about it. So it's like, I watch The Honeymooners a lot. I've seen that, you know, I've been watching The Honeymooners since I'm a kid. There's only 39 episodes of The Honeymooners. Yeah. And I watch them over and over again because I usually watch them at night when I, before I go to sleep because it calms me down. It's something com comforting. They're also very well made and, and incredible television. Uh, I think people like, Stacy says she's watched the show from day one. So a lot of people remember when it was on the air and have nostalgia for it. They used to watch it with family members who have maybe passed away. Uh, it was a more of a simpler time of their life, a more happy time in their life. And it, something about the Sopranos reminds them of that. Could be that too. Yeah. I mean, they watch it over and over and over, but there's also new people watching it. Now, I hear what you're saying about the honeymoons. I like, I've watched Seinfeld, Me as too. you have. A and lot. when I'm on the road or somewhere and I watch Seinfeld, it just kind of makes me feel like, hey, uh, kind of. You know, I don't know, uh, a little comforting. You know, I'm in a hotel room. I don't like being away that much, especially when I'm alone. So you're and, not so good on the road. You know, I've gotten, I used to be better. I used to enjoy it more, you know, uh, early on, especially the Sopranos back and forth to Vegas. And I used to be okay. You know, you go into New York, it was, I'm there to work. And then, and then as the years have gone on, I did it so, so much. I mean, I was gone. I was gone some years, six months out of the year, not altogether, but two weeks here. Oh, no, I know. I've done it too. So, you know, and I think as time went on, you're in a hotel room night after night after night, you see something that you're familiar with. It's comforting. Oh, it's Seinfeld. You know, I mean, I know it sounds weird, but, you know, after a while, the traveling, you know, it's exciting for me at first. Then it wasn't anymore, you know. Uh, and I think the new, like we've talked about so many times, uh, the show holds up every bit as it did today. You know what I mean? It shows up every bit as it did. Uh, besides the, the cars and the cell phones and the computers, uh, this show could have been made yesterday. And there's new generations. It's amazing. It. I mean, my, you know, our friend Nick Sandow, his son, who's, I guess, uh, 19 or 20, he's going to, him and his girlfriend are going to be Christopher and Adriana for Halloween. Yeah. yeah. You know, no. I mean, young people have taken to this show in a, in a huge way. I mean, I mean it's we pretty see wild. them. We go on the road. There's young people in the audience. This podcast is a lot of young people. Uh, you know, uh, they could stream it. You can watch it on Amazon and HBO Max and all these different places where you couldn't years ago. Uh, my kids watched it. They didn't watch it when they were growing up, you know, and it's uh, it holds up. Their parents watched it. They are watching it and they love it. There's probably there's a lot of people out there know more about this show than we do. Yeah, they've seen it more than us. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, Stacey, good question. Uh, and they do watch it on a loop. I also know a friend of mine used to watch porn on a loop. That'll mess your mind up. Yeah. Porn on a loop. Like Very for hours awesome. and hours? Like yeah. he was addicted. People get well, addicted yeah. to that. Yeah. Very weird. But uh, Stacy, good question from New Orleans, Louisiana. And we're going to send Stacy a pair of Bose headphones. Enjoy. Okay. So thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. I'm not going to tell you to subscribe anymore. 
I'm not going to tell you fucking nothing. Do whatever you like. We don't care if you subscribe or not. That's, That's all I got. Credit. That's it. That's all I got. Wow. I got nothing else. Our executive producers, Jeff Sussman, our producers, Annie Verderam. The music was composed and performed by Elijah Amaton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links on TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam, Ciara Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a pod jams production. Can we tell our audience what pod jams means? Sure. Or should we not? Andy, are we allowed to say that? Is that is that supposed to be a secret? <laughs> so jams are initials. J A M S. J is for Jeff, Jeff Sussman. A is for Andy, Andy Verderam. M is for Michael, and S is for Steve. So I get last billing again. Steve fought really hard to make it. I never it, even, uh, did you know something, Michael? I, I didn't even know that that's what that means. Is this true? Steve, yes. That's I where Pod Jams that. comes from. You didn't I, know that? I did not know that. Well, we we keep we keep a lot of stuff away from you, Steve. I, obviously. We kept you in the dark about a lot of stuff regarding this podcast because <laughs> we had to make it easy. <laughs> uh, I, you know, if we had you weighing in on every decision, we never would have got on the air. You know Understood. That. Understood. All right. Thousand percent, I understood. But uh, I like I like the pod jams. Very clever. Yeah, there you Andy, go. did you think that up? Jeff Sussman, the brilliant Jeff Sussman. That's why he's who he is. He's the fucking man. He's Jeff the mastermind. Sussman is the fucking man. He is the puppet master. He's the, the man. He's the guy behind streets. the guy behind the guy. You know he, that? Remember that from? Yeah. Things change. He's pulling our strings. All right, man. I'll see you uh, next week. I'll see you when I see you. Yeah.